Excellent. Okay. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Yes, you can call us a webinar. It's okay. We don't we won't be offended. <laughs> um, or we cover anything that may be of interest to librarians. Um, we do these sessions live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but they are all recorded, so if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. You can go to our website, which I will show at the end of the show, and um, look at all of our recordings for all our sessions going back to when we first started in January 2009. Um, we do all sorts of things here, presentations, interviews, <coughs> excuse me, mini training sessions. Basically, if it's related to libraries, we'll put it on the show. We are not very picky. <laughs> um, and this morning, we bring in guest speakers sometimes, and we have Nebraska Library Commission staff sometimes. And this morning, we have a mixture of people here. Um, this morning, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, O Pioneers by Willa Cather, the um, 2013 One Book, One Nebraska Choice. And I'm just going to hand over to Mary Jo Ryan here from the Library Commission, and she's going to um, introduce everything and get us going for this morning. Thanks, Krista. Um, I, as you know, I'm Mary Jo Ryan, and I have had the pleasure over the past few years of working with One Book, One Nebraska. We've read some amazing books, and many of you across the state are reading these books with your book groups or with your classrooms, and uh, we really appreciate your support and how much fun you've had doing this, too. Um, I'd like to have the, our guest today just introduce themselves. Rod, you start. Good morning. Rod Wagner, Nebraska Library Commission. Hi, I'm Andy Jewell, and I'm a guest here today. I am an associate professor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and the Cather Scholar and the co-editor of The Selected Letters of Willa Cather. And The Selected Letters of Willa Cather have been getting a lot of buzz, Andy. It has. I've been very pleased about the buzz. Yeah, New York <laughs> Times. It's all been really fun. Yeah. I'm Molly Fisher, and I'm retired, and I'm on the Nebraska Center for the Book Board, and I'm also a state library commissioner. Thanks, Molly. Um, I, I would just like to um, maybe introduce this session by just giving you a little orientation to some of the resources that are available for all of you that are doing o, o Pioneers One Book One Nebraska activities. And then I think Molly and Rob would like to have a little discussion with Andy about the book O Pioneers, but also about the book that he's co-edited about Willa Catter's letters. Um, and I just wanted to mention before I forget that Andy is available through the Humanities Nebraska um, Speakers Bureau, which is a fabulous resource to libraries across the state to have Andy come out and talk to your groups after they've read the book so and do programs. So that's just another thing to remember. If you want more details on that, that's on this website, which you're looking at right now. This is the One Book, One Nebraska official O Pioneers website. It's got information about the book, of course, about Willa Cather, it's got some information here about how to get involved, which I think is pretty interesting, and, I, and I've heard from some of you that it's been useful to you. Um, we have a resource guide. We have information about the Facebook community. We have information about how to get the book. You can get a set of books, a book club kit, for your whole reading group and, um, and maybe your whole classroom. I don't know. It depends on how big your classroom is, but we do have many copies of the book in our kits and you, this resource kit can be very useful you get a copy of the book you get discussion questions you get evaluation materials um, a list of links it's a very useful thing if you've got a group of people wanting to read the book and have fun reading it together my book group by the way just read this book and it was a really good book for discussion I guarantee you there'll be lots of discussion um, we also have information that you can use to, to promote the fact that you're doing this at your library. But one thing that I wanted to mention is somewhere in here we have information about how to work with Humanities Nebraska to get Andy to come out and do a program. And as you can see, some people are doing this. Yes. There's a bunch of programs already scheduled. So that just gives you a little bit of an idea what's available on this website. And then I want to go to the next one, which is, uh, this is a website put together especially for this year by the Willa Cather Foundation, because this is the 100th anniversary of O Pioneers. Uh, it was published in September of 1913. I was going to say that can't be right, but it was September of 1913. And, um, and the Willa Cather Foundation's got a lot of good resources on here. 
The other thing I wanted to mention is that if you're on Facebook, we do have a Facebook page just for One Book One Nebraska. And there's been a lot of sharing on this page. Um, this is about the book discussion we're having, of course, and other book discussions across the state. So this is just another resource, another way to keep up on what's going on with One Book, One Nebraska. So I can move on here. Do I want to move on to Andy's PowerPoint, huh? Sure. There we go. There she is. Isn't she adorable? <laughs> <laughs> I think she is. I think she's absolutely she is. adorable. Um, Rod Molly, do you have any questions or ideas for Andy to get started thinking about with us about not just about O Pioneers, but about his book that he has co-edited on the letters of Laura Cabot? Well, I have one right away. Um, uh, following publication of the book, or even before, yes, you've been interviewed. You've been traveling all over. Uh, how's that gone? It's been great, and then I've, I've had an attitude all along that uh, I would enjoy whatever happened, and much more has happened, frankly, than I anticipated, and so um, at the risk of being a little obnoxious, I'll, I'll retell re some people what has happened. So um, the book came out this spring, and we were uh, very pleased and very surprised to have our national press on it, and the New York Times front page did a news story on it and the front page of the New York Times book review had a positive review Both of those are great. Um, Morning Edition on NPR interviewed me. Um, the Chronicle of Higher Ed did a very nice piece on it um, and many other reviews and things and, and we've been able, my co-editor Janice Stout and I have been able to go to New York and uh, I've been to Pittsburgh and Denver and Seattle and the Southwest coming up and you know so it's been wonderful. And that's in addition to all the um, maybe the most satisfying events which have been here in Nebraska. You've had some celebrations here that have, have been wonderful. Yeah. yeah, so I've enjoyed it. <laughs> well, I don't know if I want to, I, I guess related to that, I would ask, did the letters inform you about O Pioneers? Yes, in a lot of ways they did. And I think, you know, the letters book is in some ways, Cather's life story in her own words. And one of the really important moments of her life is the writing and publication of O Pioneers. And just to sort of recap for people, she um, had been working as a journalist for a number of years before she became a professional novelist. And during time, about a decade in Pittsburgh and then quite a few years in New York, she worked as a magazine and newspaper editor and writer. And in New York, she was the um, managing editor of McClure's Magazine. Quite a wonderful job. Um, and, and, but it was a kind of job that took a lot of her energy, a lot of her time, a lot of her attention. And the whole time, she really wanted to be a professional writer. And she had been publishing stories. She had published a, a, a small book of poetry and a book of short fiction, but she hadn't been a novelist yet, and she wanted to be. In 1912, she published her first novel, Alexander's Bridge, and that's probably the least read Cather novel, in part because it is the least like Cather. It's uh, a fairly um, conventional love triangle set in Boston and London um, with some heavy-handed symbolism, uh, and she said later that, well, I'll just read what she said because I, cause it's too good to not quote it. Precisely. Um, if I can find it. Uh, she, she said it was it was a sort of kind of a kind of novel that she would rather leave behind her. Um, that it, it felt like uh, she says I, I found it. She said in O Pioneers there was no arranging or inventing. Everything was spontaneous and took its own place, right or wrong. It was like taking a ride through a familiar country on a horse that knew the way and a fine morning when you felt like riding. The other, or Alexander's Bridge, was like riding in a park with someone not altogether congenial to whom you had to be talking all the time. <laughs> um, which I love. So, you know, she, she had had, the O Pioneers would publish the next year was her first big success. And to get back to your question, what do the letters tell us about this? Well, it documents that year. And what you really feel in it is not a, a single moment where it was an aha moment, but rather this gradual, um, growth and confidence and this excitement and this decision that I think to her felt like a rather risky one to write about Nebraska and to make her own life 
and the environment she knew, the subject of her fiction, rather than London and Boston and all those more conventional places for novels. Um, she decided to do that, and during that time, she had taken a leave of absence from McClure's magazine. She went to the Southwest and visited her brother and was, was amazed by what she was experiencing in the Southwest. And she came back from that trip and wrote her old boss, S.S. McClure, I feel as if my brain has been washed in iron and is ready for a new life, you know. And uh, I think that's a great uh, line to get into the confidence that led her to put together O Pioneers. Um, and, and the letters also have uh, many t uh, interactions, especially with her friend Elizabeth Shepley Sargent, or Elsie Sargent, about um, the act of writing that book. And, you know, right during Christmas of 1912, she said she's been working hard. Um, and I'm sorry for those of you who haven't read the book, as this might spoil something about the ending, but I hope you have read it. Uh, she says she's been working hard on the murders in her story. She said, I've been three mortal days of killing them. Um, and you get it. <laughs> and her, and her, her sense of humor about it is, is really wonderful. And, and then she sends the proofs, you know, before the book was published, it, she had it in proof form as it was being designed and she could read it and edit it. She sent that to France to her friend Elsie, who was there, and who, who Elsie shared it with her friends. And uh, they gave her some encouragement. And she said, thank you so much. I was in, she said, I was in the trough of the wave about it. But now I began to, so she felt poorly. But she says, now I began to get my confidence up again. But you say it's good. So, so it's, it's one of the most, the, the sort of psychological relationship to writing that book is, is documented quite well in her letters because she was telling her friend Elsie all about it, and Elsie saved the letters, so. <laughs> Yay, Elsie. Yay, yeah. Well, and maybe you would want to um, share a little bit about the controversy around sharing sure. these letters in print. Yes, and so Cather died 66 years ago, and it's, um, you know, as a woman of, of author of her stature, it's very unusual that no letters of hers have been published before. And the reason for that is because she forbid the publication of them in her will. She said she didn't want them published at all. And that um, was a request that was respected and honored for many, many decades, and rightfully so. Um, but she also left a, a clause in her will that said she left it to the sole and uncontrolled discretion of her executor and trustee to decide finally what to do. Um, and with the death of her nephew Charles in 2011, the original trust that she established in the will, and forgive me for those who might know more legally about these things than I do, I, I'm telling you what the lawyers have told me, and so this is what I understand, um, but the trust as originally established in her will, and the kind of uh, uh, way the parameters of that trust expired, and though the, her stuff is still protected by copyrights, the new executors who are uh, the Willa Cather Trust, which is a partnership between the University of Nebraska Foundation and the Willa Cather Foundation, and some of Cather's family all agreed that they're no longer restricted by that request and that their job is to um, best be the best stewards of Cather's legacy and her works as possible. And to them, that meant making the letters available to um, stimulate interest in Cather, but also, I think, as educational institutions, they thought the scholarship and readers generally need to know about these wonderful letters. Uh, 3,000 of Cather's letters have survived. Um, wow. This book has 566 in it. Um, it's a selection of letters that is a book designed to be readable by anybody. It's not designed solely for specialists by any means. We hope specialists can you know, feel confident about using it and that it's suitable for scholars, but really um, Janice and I put it together we wanted it to be a book people could sit down and read and enjoy as the story of Cather's life, but in her own words. And, in, and for those who've long time been readers of Cather, it'll be a wonderful uh, revelation, I think, about who this woman is. Uh, you know, we have this sort of stereotype of her. Um, Keep looking at this little girl. I, maybe I will. I will uh, move on to other pictures of her. All right. There's a lot of pictures of her when she's young. Um, I love that one that you just went past the bicycles. Yes, isn't that nice? How cool is that? Well, in this actually, this picture might fit with what I was just about to say. We have this stereotype of her, which this picture doesn't fit, of kind of this grouchy old lady who was sort of a hermit who didn't want to have anything to do with anybody who burned all of her letters, um, and that kind of story has been repeated in. In print biographies and in documentary films, um, 
But when you read the letters, it's hard for me to believe that anyone could see her that way anymore because she's very vivacious, she's very funny, she has um, many and diverse loving relationships that last to the end of her life. Um, she is active in the world. It's true that in the last decade of her life, that was hard. You know, she had a difficult older age and um, that some of the decisions she made, like banning the publication of her letters, were made in those days and those decisions have colored how people see her generally. But I think this picture here of Cather with her brother and a close friend and Red Cloud riding a bike, wearing a tie, looking kind of independent and smug. <laughs> I smug is not the right word, but, but she was a fascinating woman and a strong-minded woman and um, an open-hearted person. And, and it's a wonderful personality to be around in the letters, I find. Uh, so I really feel, to go back to the original question about the controversy, I really feel that, that it was right to honor her wishes for many, many years while all those she wrote about survived. Um, but now they're all gone. And what, we don't know for sure why she banned the publication of her letters. Mm -hmm. It's true. Uh, she was interested in, in her works being the way she was represented to the public, for sure, you know, and, and her mature works. And so, you know, she didn't um, ban the republication, and she couldn't probably have the republication of her early short fiction or journalism, but she certainly didn't want people to know about that either. She wanted people to know her as the mature writer who, you know, from like O Pioneers on, basically, it was, so it was after she, she was 40 when O Pioneers came out, about 40. Um, so she, she she didn't want people to uh, get into a personal life. But now, so whatever those concerns were, I think, are no longer uh, relevant in the way they were in her own time, mm -hmm. um, because she is now part of our shared cultural history. And, her, and in a very simple way, I think her letters are so good and she has so much to offer us in them that, that publishing them now enriches the world a little bit. You know, mm -hmm. it, it gets people access to, to these texts. And, and to me, that makes it absolutely worth it and overwhelms any um, misgivings that I might have. I was going to say, too, that the letters that she wrote to her family and at the end of her life, yes. when, um, she, after her brother had died, yes. uh, I just found them so moving. And she wrote to her nieces. Yes. And they're just full of love and heart. And they're absolutely beautiful, I think. I agree. And um, I don't think you have seen that so much from her. Yeah. But I mean, what it, what it led me to think about is how many of us write to our family members. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that um, one lesson I have from that book, I have a friend who has uh, three daughters in college, and he writes to them almost at least once a week and they have stacks of his letters. Yeah, nice. But what do we what do we have today that will in any way tell that kind of story? Yeah. The deep commitment she had. Um, yeah, you know that a lot of people have asked me about, you know, in this age of email and text and are we are our relationships that we communicate through writing with, you know, in those kind of ways that, is there any way to have anything like this for future mm -hmm. writers? And part of it is, well, no, this specific thing, this kind of writing is, was a product of its time, right, and, and letter writing. Um, but I also feel like we, that someday it might not seem crazy to have a book of people's emails to one another. They might, might, that might exist, and it might seem natural because that was the, uh, the technology of our time, you know. Um, so That's what I was going to say. It's about the content, not the container. Yeah people may be writing these same types of letters and heartfelt things, but in an email to their daughter or yeah. to their son or to their grandmother or whatever. And, and hopefully those are being saved somewhere. Not just, right. And whether or not those survive, papers, we just happen to live long enough yeah. to know what is going to survive and what mm -hmm. isn't. I mean, there's, it is, of course, lots of danger of any paper things surviving. And many of Cather's letters, we can say pretty confidently, haven't survived because we, we don't have them now. If they have survived, we don't know where they are. You know, likewise, we don't know what will survive from our current tech culture. It's probably our texts won't survive, and maybe that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've captured uh, Facebook threads, for example, yeah. that are so revealing. And, and, you know, it's just such a neat thing to see these people go back and forth and learn and discuss yeah. things. And so we capture those sometimes when we see them, and 
Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if they'll be there around or, or not, but they're captured now. Yeah, well, that's good. I mean, that, I mean, that's that's one of the. I think this is happening with lots of libraries across the world. Is realizing that our culture now communicates in, in digital means, and let's figure out ways to save that for the future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Has the uh, book and the publicity led to any other letters? Uh, Coming forward. Um, in, in little bits here and there, I've I, uh, no big um, dramatic revelations yet, but but I have been encouraged that a few people, I won't go into details, but um, have contacted me and have acknowledged they, they are aware of some letters and they have one or two, um, and that's great, and I applaud those people for um, starting to bring these things to light, and, and that's frankly one thing we hoped would happen was that after this book was published, people would realize the value of maybe something they have they didn't realize was of interest to others necessarily. You know, that's true. Or you know, what, one thing that often happens, some big repositories, things that are lost are actually just in unprocessed collections in big, big repositories and libraries, and they can still be discovered by the librarians themselves. Um, one time I was writing to Dartmouth University and uh, asking about what turned out to be a fairly minor cavity letter they had there. Uh, but the archivist wrote back and said, oh, and we've recently found we have two letters from Cather to Robert Frost. Would you be interested in seeing those? And I said, oh, well, yes, thank you. Those would be great. And you know, that, that's a case where those had probably been there for a while, but for very um, understandable reasons, and I work in a library, I understand this, that you get so much material, it can't all be understood and, and cataloged and processed immediately. So, so I'm hoping in for multiple ways through people's attics or through libraries themselves that more things will come to light. Well, one thing I noticed about just reading this, in fact, I'm just overwhelmed how you could even narrow the 3,000 down <laughs> to this, this many, is you categorize them pretty much by the chronological yes. uh, life of Cather. But you do such a good job of giving us little signals, you know, about this happened during such and such, and oh, good. yeah, that really was very helpful, I thought. Good, and that, that's something we really wanted to do. We knew that, you know, to tell a kind of narrative of her life, there aren't letters that give every little detail, so you have to fill it in. So we've um, tried to arrange it, so be, you know, at the beginning of each of the 12 chapters, or 12 sections, um, in between letters, we have some of our own words that kind of tell people what's going on in her life, when, who these people are that she's talking about. Um, inside the text of letters, sometimes we'll have little bracketed identifications, so you know if she mentions um, West Virginia, that she means her niece Virginia Cather, you know, who lived in the West, as opposed to her niece Mary Virginia Ald, who lived in Red Cloud, you know. I mean, <laughs> so so just, just things that you wouldn't know as a casual reader. You, explain to you. Um, and I've said before that the, our goal it could be there's two things we want to accomplish that as a, a reader reads this book that they're struck and, and um, what they experience is Lily Cather's voice and they're not interrupted all the time by an editorial voice inserting itself and sort of interrupting Cather. At the same time I don't want people to feel confused. So if we can get that balance right where we have provide enough editorial information so people feel comfortable and like they know what's happening and, and not so much that it interrupts. That's what we really went for. Yeah. I think you do a great job of that. <laughs> Thank you, Molly. Well one of the things that, that struck me is um I, I saw an exhibit at the Nebraska State Historical Society last year of Cather's fashion. Sense. Oh yes. And it wasn't just it wasn't just her clothes, it was also accessories and, and lots of I mean she was Quite a fashionista. Yes, especially you know she, and it's a combination. I love of, that. That's not great. Right? Oh yeah, <laughs> I'll tell you about that picture in a second. But it was a fashion. Yes, she had this fashion sense that um, most day to day was pretty simple. Um, one of the things she's most well known is like the midi blouse that sort of looks like a sailor shirt, little tie. She's very famously photographed in that. And I loved that same display. They showed that that was an Amber Crombie and Fitch, which I didn't know had been around so long <laughs> that she just bought it at the store. You know, it was not, not I mean, it was, it was a nice thing, but she, like, uh, plain, sensible clothing. But then um, she would indulge herself with 
some, especially as she grew older and could afford it. Uh, you know, the occasional fur collar on a coat or a lovely um, green jacket, which is a, a beautiful jacket that they have in Red Cloud that it's all embroidered. Yes. Yes. It looks Stunning. sort of southwestern, although I believe the story is that her um, publisher, Blanche Knopf, Alfred Knopf's wife, who's a partner in the publishing house, bought it for her in France. And so it's it's really quite nice. So she she did love nice clothing. Um, and that's good. In this picture, let me tell you one thing that's kind of fun. This has been, in many people, one of their favorite new pictures of Cather. And it's when her first trip to Europe in 1902. She was living in Pittsburgh then. She went with her friend Isabel McClung. Um, it was a really important mm -hmm. moment in Cather's life. And this great picture is a tiny little picture on the front of a scrapbook that, yeah. uh, that came to the University of Nebraska Lincoln Libraries about a decade ago through mm -hmm. Cather's family. It was uh, Helen Cather Southwick. Um, Cather's niece who donated it. And it was a, a scrapbook that I believe, looking at the evidence, that probably either she made or, or her friend Isabel, who went on, on a trip with her, made and gave to her. And it's full of photographs, just this candid snapshots from the trip, and postcards. And Cather wrote articles for the Nebraska State Journal while she was on this trip and mailed them, or you know, telegraphed them back or mailed them back to Lincoln where they were published. And those articles are cut out and pasted in the scrapbook. So it's a wonderful document of Cather's life. Wow. And, yeah, and such a great, great look hat. on her face and a great hat. Yes. Yeah. Um, and we encourage anybody out there who'd like to type in a question about anything relating to O Pioneers or the letters book to go ahead and do so. Um, I thought it might be fun. Uh, to read a couple of letters that have to do with O Pioneers. That might, that might, some of the things I was referencing earlier. Um, and to give you a sense of that time in her life where so many things uh, happened. And I'll just, I'll just read a few bits here. And, and if there's a question that comes up, feel free to, to uh, just speak up or do it. And, See, I love that hat. Oh, man. Or yeah. I love her hats. I'm telling yeah, you. she's a woman of many wonderful hats. That's <laughs> true. Well, here's a letter from 1912 uh, that she wrote to her friend Elsie Sargent, I mentioned earlier. And this is when she just arrived. She just took that leave of absence from McClure's magazine. And this is the, the month that would see the sort of birth of O Pioneers as a, as a novel. Um, and you can see in this first letter, I think, something about her hesitancy writing about Nebraska. She says, Dear Elsie, I've been tramping about the West for two weeks now and have just reached my mail, which is all forwarded to Winslow. That's in Arizona. The West always paralyzes me a little. When I'm away from it, I remember only the tang on the tongue. But when I come back, I always feel a little of the fright I felt when I was a child. I always feel afraid of losing something. I don't in the least know what it is. It's real enough to make a tightness in my chest even now. And when I was little, it was even stronger. I can never entirely let myself go with the current. I always fight it just a little, just as people who can't swim fight it when they are dropped into water. It's the partly a feeling that there are so many miles, wait till you travel them, between you and anything, and partly the feeling that the everlasting wind may make you contented and put you to sleep. I used to always be sure that I'd never get out, that I would die in a cornfield. <laughs> now I know I will get out again, but I still get attacks of fright. I wish I didn't. I somehow feel that if one were really a fit person to write about a country, I wouldn't feel that. Mm -hmm. Well, she must have got over that a little bit because yeah. she's starting to write. <laughs> um, and this is this is also a part of the letter I mentioned before to her her boss, who's now becoming her old boss, S. S. McClure, the founder of McClure's Magazine. Um, and she wrote this from Red Cloud, Nebraska, in, in June of 1912, after she had come back from her spring in the, in the Arizona area. She said, I have not written a line since I left New York, but I have such a head full of stories that I dream about them at night. I've ridden and driven hundreds of miles. You would not know me. I'm so dark-skinned and good-humored. Oh, please forget how cranky I used to be when I was tired. I can't bear to have you remember me like that. It all seems so foolish now, such an ado about nothing. I'm never going to get fussy like that again. I've never been so happy since I was a youngster as I have been this summer, back in my own country with my own people. Those weeks off in, in the desert with my big handsome brother, six feet four he is, mm -hmm. and his wild pals all week, also, are, are weeks I shall never forget. They took all the kinks and crumples out. I feel as if my mind had been freshly washed and ironed and were ready for a new life. I feel somehow 
confident. Feel as if I'd got my second wind. I would never torture myself about little things like the art department again. That's, that's in a magazine. I, I, I feel like that's so important that, um, that what it really took Cather to produce O Pioneers, which we now look back and, and see as a, as a really classic and important statement of, um, in literature and about this area of the world too, is that confidence. Um, that's so important. And you know, that's not uncommon with, with writers. I remember once seeing in, when uh, uh, John Steinbeck was writing Grapes of Wrath, he, uh, he had been struggling with other works, but then he started writing that book and he wrote in his journal, I've got my confidence on. And I, I love that phrase, and I feel like this is kind of what's happening in the cabin here. It's just, it's a temporary feeling, but it, need, it was necessary to get the project off the ground to have the confidence to do it. Um, okay, I was going to see something else that... I wanted to share with you. Okay, so this is after O Pioneers has been written, and her friend Elsie has read it, and, and she's responding to it. And for those of you who have read it, you'll know that, well, maybe more than some Cather books, but it isn't the kind of book that has a typical kind of plot. I mean, there's lots of little episodes that happen. It's sort of um, a, a cyclical plot in some ways. You know, we it, kind of following the weather, and, uh, you know, there is a, there is some some melodrama in it with the murders and the, um, and that kind of thing, but it, it also has a different sort of tone than you might can, you might think of like the typical 19th century plot that you know someone starts out as a child, grows up and gets married, makes a fortune, and that's the end. You know that, or, or the tragic version of that story, right? I mean, it, that that's not what <laughs> pioneers is like. Um, and and here she's kind of I think referring to that quality of the novel in this April letter of 1913 to her friend Elsie Sargent. She says, my dear Elsie, I feel such a sense of relief that you do like it. You put your finger exactly on the weak spot when you say that the skeleton does not stand out enough. The modeling is not bold, but the country itself has no skeleton, no rocks or ridges. It's a fluid black soil that runs through your fingers, composed not by the decay of big vegetation, but of the light ashes of grass. It's all soft, and somehow that influences the mood in which one writes of it, and so the very structure of the story. Oh, I would like to do one with nice, sharp lines, like the mountains you now have behind you. That I would. Mr. Greenslit, who is her publisher at Houghton Mifflin, rose to the occasion like a gentleman. He was delightfully enthusiastic about the story, and they're rushing it into type without delay. He is very strong for Marie, one of the characters in the book, like the other gentleman. I believe Frank satisfies me more than any of the people in it. Just now I'm in a trough with a wave about it. Having got it through and arranged for, I can be honest with myself and admit that I really want to do a very different sort of thing. Goodbye, W. I think that letter gets us a couple of revelations. One is how all, all the gentlemen liking Marie, that's no big surprise. She's a very uh, infectious character. But that she feels Frank is the most satisfying. He's, he's often the least liked character in the book. And so you might ask yourself, satisfying in what way? Um, in some ways, I think she means as a sort of creator that he feels right to her. Yeah. He, yeah, it feels real to her. Um, you know, and there, there are things about Frank that bother a lot of people about this novel, and particularly the very end, where Alexandra has that unusual, to many readers, reaction to Frank's killing of Emma Marie, and that she wants to help him, she wants to forgive him, she feels somehow responsible. All of those things have perplexed a lot of readers, and I think there are many different ways to read it, and I'm not going to offer one answer. I think mm -hmm. different readers will have different mm -hmm. conclusions about it, um, but, I, but it is different. And then she says she wants to do something very different, and those who have read her next novel, Song of the Lark, will know it is quite different. In a way, it's the most like that 19th century plot I told you about, about the young person who grows up and becomes successful. But it's, it's, it's that story catharized. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's more interesting than that um, in a lot of ways. I wanted to ask a question about Alexandra because yes. I grew up on a farm. Yes. And I think never once did I consider being a farmer. Of course, mm. that's different from what a little bit from what Alexandra did. But she's such a strong character, um, and I think she really reflects on her brothers. Yes. And she reflects on uh, 
all the men in the mm -hmm. novel. And I wondered, uh, I don't, I don't know, I can't remember anything that I read in the letters, but um, how did Cather get to Alexandra? Because she really is, I mean, yes. she's forgiving, she's loving, she loves the land. Mm -hmm. um, she's smart as heck. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she's, much, she's much better than the man. She's really kind of a hero. Yes. And, uh, oh, yes, and, and you know, she is, she is, I would say she is, She's a brilliant woman in a lot of ways, but brilliant for something specific. She's a brilliant sort of farmer. I think it's interesting. Businesswoman. Yeah, businesswoman. Um, the, the book kind of points out how she she has a blindnesses about her too. Like she doesn't she doesn't see Emil and Marie's relationship coming, which is a she, so she doesn't understand everything about people, right? Um, which is actually fascinating about her character because she isn't just an infallible heroine. There's something else about her. Um, and she waits forever for yes. the love of her life. Right, for Carl, right. <laughs> yeah. um, so she is, a, I mean, that character I think is probably the most compelling thing about O Pioneer. There's a lot of compelling things, but, but it's such a distinctive character. She's uh, undeniably a successful businesswoman. That's pretty unusual, 1913. Um, and within her own world, she, she overcomes some prejudices about her gender, I think, among some of the neighbors and her brothers, and yet she seems to do so without hardly even acknowledging them. It doesn't seem to bother her. You know, she just, she is so strong. You know, not unlike Cather herself. Cather was a woman who um, was professional, um, rose very high in journalism, maybe the most powerful woman in journalism before she became a novelist, and then she was an independent novelist. That she, you know, she, to do that took some grit, and I think she liked when other people had that, and she gave that to her character. Mm -hmm. um, there has been no single prototype discovered for who Alexandra, who's inspired the character of Alexandra, the way there have been for many of Cather's later books. There have been people in history who have been pointed to as inspiring Cather to write, create those characters. Um, so maybe there is a person that this hasn't been discovered yet who inspired Alexandra, or maybe in a way she's a kind of um, a vision of a, of a kind of person that Cather admired, that Cather mm -hmm. saw around her. I don't, I think she feels real to me. You know, I know that though we have these ideas of 19th century um, farms being dominated by men, there are many examples of women who filed homestead claims, of women who were mm -hmm. uh, the ones running the places. And uh, that story hadn't been told very much before, O Pioneers. And so maybe she was, in a way, telling that story. And I think she, it was just more interesting for her to make it uh, from a woman's perspective. And, and as an earlier, there are some letters later on which suggest, too, that she felt, um, and this is something that she would soon abandon, but as a woman novelist, she felt early that she, she sort of had to write from a woman's perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Maya Antonia, only a few years later, she writes the whole story from a male's perspective, and the first person narrator is Jim Burden, a male. Mm -hmm. and, and that um, she recognize, you can tell in the letters, that that was a risk she was taking. But as now we look back and see my Antonia as maybe, you know, one of the great classics of our literature that it, it paid off for her to take yeah. that risk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Do we have uh, um, questions from No questions. I was going to say, if anyone on the line does have any questions or comments or your thoughts on why she wrote some of these things or who some of these characters maybe were, um, type them into your question section of your GoToWebinar interface, or let me know that you have a microphone, and I can unmute you, and you can join us in the conversation. So that's Alexandra, huh? Well, it's From Clarence. From the Floyd Publishers' point of view. Yeah, it's Clarence Underwood. I, um, later, I th when it was first published, Cather referred to her, to her friend Elsie. She said, I must tell you about the Swede who posed for the frontispiece, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so she would was aware of who, somehow who this woman was who was the model for this. Um, but later, only a few years later, she told her publisher, uh, Houghton Mifflin, can we please take out this incongruous um, picture? Because it does, it, it really, I think we can, a lot of us who are readers of the book will say, that doesn't look like Alexandra at all. It looks like a very prettified Gibson girl, you know, yeah. from the era. Um, but it's an interesting uh, picture. And of course, you know, it, having some kind of illustration was seen as good for marketing and you know and that's why it's here um, a lot of it. it might be worth pointing out another important 
thing that Cather dedicated this book to the writer Sarah Orne Jewett. And um, those of you who have read Sarah Orne Jewett, Sarah Orne Jewett, I will, will remember her because she's wonderful, I, I hope, and, and you'll, uh, you'll, you'll appreciate the connections between Cather's writing and Jewett. Jewett was a 19th century writer. She was from Maine, um, and she wrote about her world in Maine. Um, and, and the small towns and the, and the seasides. Um, her, her novel, The Country of the Pointed Furs, is a wonderful book. Um, it, I've taught it and I love it very much. In fact, Cather said in the essay once that you know, the three books that she thought would have a very long life in American literature it was The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, The Scarlet Letter, and Jewett's The Country of the Pointed Furs. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a really wonderful book, and she dedicated to it, as you can see, to the memory of Sarah Orne Jewett and whose beautiful and delicate work there is the perfection that endures. And I thought, if we have a moment here, unless someone has a question, I would share a little bit from a, a really remarkable letter, certainly one of the favorite letters in the book, that Cather wrote to Jewett. And they became friends in the last few months of Jewett's life. Um, Jewett, they only about 16 months they know each other, but in those, that, those were important times. Uh, his Cather found this connection with another woman writer, and Jewett gave her some, some really uh, wonderful advice and was able to be a person Cather could tell certain things to. And so there's a very long letter. I won't read all of it um, because it's so long, but there's, but there's a letter from 1908 when Cather was working at the magazine that she wrote to Jewett that um, really lays bare, I think, some of the struggles that she was having uh, and... and in both being successful at the magazine, but really wanting to be a novelist, really having this other ambition for her life. And, and I'll just read a little bit of this. My dear, dear Miss Jewett, such a kind and earnest and friendly letter as you sent me. I've read it over many times. I've been in deep perplexity these last few years, and troubles that concern only one's habits of mind are such personal things. They're hard to talk about. You see, I was not made to have to do with affairs, what Mr. McClure calls men and measures. If I get on in that kind of work, it is by going at it with the sort of energy most people have to exert only on rare occasions. Consequently, I live just about as much during the day as a trapeze performer does when he is on the bars. It's catch the right bar at the right minute or into the net you go. I feel all the time so dispossessed and bereft of myself. My mind is off doing trapeze work all day long and only comes back to me when it is dog tired and wants to creep into my body and sleep. Mr. McClure tells me he does not think I will ever be able to do much writing stories. If I'm a good executive, I better let it go at that. I sometimes, indeed I very often think that he is right. If I've been going forward at all in the last five years, it has been progress of the head but not of the hand. At 34, one ought to have some sureness in their pinpoint and some facility in turning out a story. In other matters, things about the office, I can usually do what I set out to do and I can learn by experience. But when it comes to writing, I'm a newborn baby every time, always come into it naked and shivery and without any bones. I never learn anything about it at all. I sometimes wonder whether one can possibly be meant to do the thing which they are more blind and inept and blundering at than anything else in the world. But the question of work aside, one has the right to live and reflect and feel a little. When I was teaching, I did. I, I learned more or less all the time. But now I have the feeling of standing still, except for a certain kind of facility in getting the sort of material Mr. McClure wants. It's stiff mental exercise, but it's about as much food to live by as elaborate mental arithmetic would be. Of course, there are interesting people and interesting things in the day's work, but it's all like going around the world in a railway train and never getting off to see anything closer. Hmm. Now, the kind of life that makes one feel empty and shallow and superficial that makes one dread to read and dread to think it can't be good for one, can it? It can't be the kind of life one was meant to live. I do think that kind of excitement does to my brain exactly what I have seen alcohol do men's. It seems to spread one's very brain cells apart so they don't touch. Everything leaks out as the power does in a broken circuit. So whether or not the chief is right about my never doing much writing, I think one's immortal soul is to be considered a little. He thrives on this perpetual debauch. But five years more of it will make me a fat, sour, ill-tempered lady and fussy, worst of all, and assertive. And all people who do feats on the flying trapeze and never think are as cocky as terriers after rats, you know. <laughs> of all these things and many others, I long to talk with you. Devotedly, Lilith.
Oh, that is a great letter. <laughs> it is so great. I, I just... Uh, That's a good insight there to how all that... Yes, oh. <laughs> how it feels, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I love that letter. I mean, it's the you know, metaphors alone in it, I think, make it, make it worth adding to the canon of American literature. I think it's great. So, you know, when it's, frankly, when reading letters like that in archives and thinking, oh, people need to see this, people need to know this, that, that you know, Though I appreciate that some people have felt uncertain about publishing Cather's letters um, when she said she didn't want them published, I, I don't feel worried about that. I, yeah. just, I feel like the living um, get so much out of them that that justifies it. Have you heard directly from people that... Oh, yes. I've got a little hate mail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and, and the, the most common place to hear from people, hear from people, are the anonymous comments on media sites that have covered in articles. When people are protected by the anonymity of the internet, they tend to say all sorts of things, of course. Um, and yeah. and uh, there are a lot of people, and one of my favorites though, and I um, I will say is there is somebody who, who made their, dis I don't even know who the person is, but it's the same username or whatever, who made their displeasure known um, a few times, but then when one of the articles quoted from the letters, they said, well, I don't like it, but I I don't like that you publish these letters, but I do really like that quote. You know? <laughs> 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 well, you well, okay. that That's point. right. <laughs> so, so, and I think, and I think right. that you know, it is true that there's been a little resistance, but the the support and the understanding has far outnumbered the resistance in my experience. At least those are who is talking to me about it. Yeah. And I think in understanding how it changed with who was in charge of her will and everything. I think yeah. a lot of the things I read that, you know, that horrible headline, but oh my God, against her will, against her will. Yeah. Well, that's not the full story. Right. That's just a little, you know, snippet blurb and you're not really understanding what actually happened and that it's actually now, you can read more I, I, that's and right. understand, it's actually okay. You know, one line I like, there was a this scholar who was did, did this article shortly after Cather died on, on literary wills and literary executorship. Mm -hmm. And he had read Cather's will as in the early 50s, and he said, Miss Cather understood that the future must make its own decisions. Mm -hmm. She would just put the future off as long as possible. <laughs> and I think, yeah, and you know, we've, 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 we've lived till then, so we're, we're, we're in good. the future. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We do have one question oh, for the audience. Um, Susie Dunn is from our Southeast Community College here in Nebraska. Um, she says, I know the author Rose Wilder Lane was about 13 years younger, but did Cather and Lane ever interact or meet? I think both of them. I think of both of them as trailblazers and independent women. I have wondered that myself before, um, because and I don't know much about Rose Wilder Lane, but I know she is the daughter of Laura Ingalls Wilder, mm -hmm. and um, and she likely helped really construct those books, the Laura Ingalls Wilder books. She also did many other things and was a very um, important woman in her own right. Uh, I have looked in vain for a connection between them and hoping that there would mm -hmm. be one. I have never found a connection. Uh, there was once a, min a mention of a Miss Wilder that got me excited, mm -hmm. but I found out it was Thornton Wilder's sister. It wasn't <laughs> Rose Wilder Lane, um, who, who she was talking about. So, so no, I, I don't know of any connection between them. And, uh, they, you know, there are still things left to discover, of course, but in the evidence so far, there hasn't been anything. Another person who um, many might be interested to know of connections between Cather is Mari Sandoz and Cather. Mm -hmm. Many people have asked about that. Um, there's only one minor connection between them that I can see. Sandoz, in the early 30s, wrote Cather a fan letter for Shadows in the Rock, mm -hmm. and Cather responded with a thank you. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's about all, and that's, that's in the Sandoz papers. Um, I haven't seen any other connection or any son they ever met, or, mm -hmm. or even that Cather was aware of her works that, that, ended, that started coming out at the end of Cather's life. So I would, I would like to find out more about that. It seems... Yeah. Um, like they probably could have made a connection later on more than that. One of the, the things that I'm interested in is just the mechanics of putting together oh, yeah. a book like this. I know you and your co-editor worked on this for many years. Yes, so um, in a lot of ways that Janice Stout, um, when she started off the important work of collecting all the transcriptions of letters um, many, many years ago before I was well, she did it in the early 90s. Um, she started with that, I think, and was doing it for another project that she had. She, she was writing a, a cultural biography of Cather and just thought she needed to go into the archives and find these things. And she found a bunch of letters. And in 2002, um, when the ban was still very much in effect, put out a book called A Calendar of the Letters of Willa Cather. 
and that calendar are basically a, a summary of the a very brief thumbnail sketch of what's in the letters and just a record of where they are and that's a very useful sort of reference book um, when I started my job at the University Libraries in 2004, one of the uh, first things they wanted to do was take some of our new collections that had come in and expand that calendar of letters digitally. And so Janice and I started working on a, a, a digital edition with, with more letters and, and then began a few years of working on letters together until, um, I'll get to your question, this is a long story, mm -hmm. I know, but uh, and then until she, she asked me very generously um, in about 2007 or so, 2008 maybe, um, that she said, if, if you will agree to try to do a book of letters, whether I'm living or not, I will give you all of my transcriptions and, and I will be the co-editor of that book because she did, had done a ton of work that she was feared would get lost, mm -hmm. right? And I said, well, Janice, I, love, I would love to do that project. I certainly hope that we can do it while you're still here and we can do it together. And frankly, that's, so that's what happened. We got to do it together. So we um, spent a few years doing the preparation work, and we saw the likelihood that the, the executorship would change. And then uh, we were all set. So once we knew we had permission, we also had a publishing contract, um, and I had a, a six-month faculty development research leave to um, work on it. And we spent a couple of years just putting it together in the nuts and bolts way. Wow. So, yeah, um, and it's been a real pleasure to work with Janice. It was great, and I just saw her last weekend, and I'll see her in a couple of weeks. And so it's, it's funny. We did the whole work on the book via email, pretty yeah. much. Um, she was uh, in Texas, and I was in Lincoln, and we were able to do it all that way. And we, we saw each other um, just before we just started that real intensive work in 2011, and then at the on the day of publication this is the next time we saw each other uh, in person, though we exchanged emails several times a day most days. And, uh, uh, and now I've had a wonderful chance. One of the greatest things about this book coming out and the attention is we've got to see each other a lot more and get to know one of those families a little bit, and, and that's been great. She's and wonderful. You can get the band together now and tour. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, that's great. Well, it must have really been, I mean, to select from so many letters. Oh, yes. I guess, yeah, yeah, I should answer that part of the question. Um, <laughs> yes, so that was hard. Um, what we did is we read all the letters, all we could find in order, in chronological order, more or less, to try to figure out what a selection, the best selection would be that would represent all the different sides of her personality, all the different relationships, the different qualities of her work, um, would, would the, her comments on her creative work, etc. Um, and then we made independently uh, selections and then kept having to revise those selections and sometimes adding things in, but most of the time taking things out because we had a very helpful, but in a way it's a painful word limit. You know, the publisher said, you can't make the book too big, it'll be too expensive, and no one will ever buy it, right? And it won't be very good. It won't be a very good book if it's too big. So this is a generous sized book, I think. It's mm -hmm. 700 pages or so. Um, but uh, we get, kept having to narrow down, and I, I think that process was a very helpful one, and we could really think about what was crucial to keep in there um, and what would be important in order to represent Cather, and also ones that we just felt as editors were the best letters, you know, the most um, heartfelt, the most uh, articulate, the funniest, you know, et cetera. There are some letters in there that are in there only because we think they're funny, I doubt <laughs> um, And... And, and we, we rarely disagreed. I mean, a couple of times we, we each had different perspectives, but we're able to resolve those quite easily. At least that's my version of it. <laughs> we'll check the channel. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? We're almost at the end of our hour here. Anybody have any questions, comments, thoughts you want to share? Or Andy, if you'd like to share any other slides. Well, one thing I, here's a picture of Janice. I wanted you to be able to see her. Um, and you can also see in that picture Canada's penmanship, and I'll show you a little more. Oh, gosh. One of the challenges of making this book was uh, transcribing the originals. Um, and a, a penmanship that is very challenging for those not used to looking at it. Um, it gets less challenging when you spend more time with it, as you would expect. Um, we really felt at the beginning, because of her lack of care over making each letter in a word, that we would probably have many cases in the book with, with 
um, transcriptions we couldn't resolve. We didn't know what the letter said. And I was very pleased at the end to sort of look and realize only a couple of those remained. A couple of, usually there were names or something like that where we just couldn't be 100% confident, but we always had a reading in, unless there's one or two cases where, where a piece of a letter was missing. But otherwise, we had a, had a, a, a guess. And so we're able to make pretty clean um, transcriptions. And so it should be, one should be able to read through her letters without being interrupted by sloppiness. That's, that's one of the things we wanted. Although we did try to retain her original spelling. And for those who read it, when you start the book, you'll think, oh my goodness, this woman couldn't spell at all. <laughs> because the early letters when she was 14, 15, 16, she was a terrible speller. I mean, <laughs> just as making it up as she goes along, apparently. And uh, uh, we did leave that as it was. Um, but she, in college, it looked like she learned to spell. And, <laughs> and the rest of her life, that wasn't such a problem. <laughs> wow. And these are some letters from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln archives. Um, a really wonderful collection. Most of these are from is the Roscoe and Maida Cather collection, the letters to her brother Roscoe and his family. And that only came to lie a few years ago, thanks to the wonderful generosity of the Cather family who had it. And it was one of the great days of my working life when they walked in. We knew they were coming, but they walked in with um, bags full of letters, and we opened them up, and just 400 new letters from Cather are there. And, you know, at that point, we only knew of about 12, maybe about 2,000 that existed, so 400 was a significant increase. Mm -hmm. um, and they're wonderful letters. Oh, they're, they're the best. Follow. And at the end of the at the end of the book, we did, I, we did not make any decisions on what to include based upon what repository owned them. We didn't want, you know, to have a any to think about that really, just about the content. But at the end, I I need to go and check every transcription against the originals, need to know where the repository was. So I made a a, a table that showed where everything was, and I looked. Okay, what repository did we pick from the most? Um, and it was UNL, which wasn't surprising because it had the biggest collection. But then what collection? It was the Roscoe Made a Cather collection. And that also wasn't too surprising to me because those letters are so remarkable. I mean, they're really wonderful um, and heartfelt letters to her brother. And are those digitized in the Willie Cather archives available the online? Le the letters are not yet. Um, we got permission to do this book, and we, we have an ambition of doing a, um, something more with the letters, uh, even broader access to the letters in the future. Like online. maybe an exhibit or something on the archives? It, it, well, exhibit or even... Um, Access, I mean, there's, this is still in the earliest of dream stages in some ways. Well, a little beyond that. But after a few years, we'll have the permissions, I believe, to be able to put up, like, all of Cather's letters online. Wow. Um, that would be something we'd like to do. That would be an enormous amount of work and take enormous resources to do what we want to. So we have to work out how that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but we have an agreement with the Cather Trust and with the publisher that we won't do that immediately. We'll let this book be out for a couple of years first. So. Great. Wow, that would be a huge project. Yes. Oh, the Mexico. Picture. Oh, yes. Great. Yeah, here she is at Mesa Verde. Mm -hmm. um, Again with the hats. Yeah, always a hat. And that's the midi blouse I was referring to yeah. earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and that's taken in the field where she pitched a tent, and it's probably the tent behind her where she would go and write My Antonia mm -hmm. in New Hampshire near where she is buried today in Jackson, New Hampshire. This picture, which is on the cover of the book, um, is one of my favorite pictures of Cather, and it's just a tiny little snapshot, like two inches by three inches, that came in with the Southwick material, the same uh, people who donated that from one of the, the scrapbook. And it had, to my knowledge, I don't think it had been published before, except on something I'd, I had done for the digital project, the Willa Cather Archive, which I edit. Um, that I, we shared it, Janice and I, with the publishers and the designers of the book, along with several others, and I was so pleased that they picked this for the cover. Um, I, I feel like it's a very nice picture to have on the cover. This is one later in life. I think that's the last slide. Well, if there are no other questions from the audience, I want to thank you all, especially you, Andy. This has just been a great show. We've had a great time. Thank you. And this will be archived, so if you have friends that were unable to view it live, they're more than welcome to check in. Krista will be sending out a note with all the information about where to, to you know, get it. Yes. Oh, I can do that. And if, and if um, 
I'm on Humanities Nebraska as a speaker too, and I enjoy talking about Cali around the state. And so if anyone is interested in having me come to your library or anyplace else, just you can find me through Humanities Nebraska Speakers Bureau. Thank you all. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, we will switch over to... Ah, okay, so I'm gonna drag the microphone this way now. Hey, thank you everyone for attending and thank you very much Molly and Andy, Rod and Mary Jo for uh, being here today to ask questions and chat. This is very cool, I think. Um, we have a comment just saying very interesting. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Which I agree, definitely. <laughs> so as Mary just said, it's been recorded. Um, I've captured all of the um, websites and URLs and some of the um, interviews that you mentioned that you did um, in the Commission's Delicious account. So those will be available for you when we're done. And the PowerPoint with those great photos will be also included as well when we get the recording up. So that will wrap it up for today's Encompass Live. But I hope you'll join us next week when it will be our monthly tech talk with um, Michael Sowers. Normally he does this the last Wednesday of the month, but he's bumped it up a couple of weeks. Um, what we're having join, joining him is Aaron Tay, who is the Senior Librarian and E-Services Facilitator at the National University of Singapore. He will be joining Michael from Singapore. I don't know what time it will be there, but <laughs> it won't be 10 a.m. <laughs> it will still be at 10 a.m. Um, I haven't done the math on that. Um, to talk about using how libraries can work with and use Wikipedia, linking from things in Wikipedia out to your library, because we know people go there, and then using Wikipedia to help enhance what you do at your library. So he is going to be joining Michael next week, so I hope you'll join us for that. Um, Encompass Live is also on Facebook, so if you are a big Facebook user, please do um, go ahead and go there, log in and like our page, and you'll get announcements of when things are coming, are happening, when a new session is coming up, when recordings are available, will all be posted on our Facebook page. So if you are a big Facebook user, um, definitely go there and um, like us on Facebook. Other than that, we are wrapped up for today. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here this morning, and thank you, everyone, for attending, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, Kristen. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.